Hello, my name is This, and I'm here to talk to you about these. Specifically, I'm here to talk to you about these, and their untapped potential for this. At first I thought I'd just come in and summarize my paper with a half-assed PowerPoint show, but then I remembered that that would bore you almost as much as it would bore me, and I am being graded here, so I hope that this video presentation makes my thesis at least a little more interesting. I guess we'll see. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the whole video game scene, this may not interest you in the least, which is fine. Feel free to plug your ears and imagine I'm talking about Salvador Dali or something. So, video games and storytelling. If you play games, or if you happen to observe them over your significant other's shoulder from time to time, you may have noticed that the nerdy button-mashing toys are telling stories now. Not always especially well, but they are trying. The truth is, video games actually have a great deal of potential as a narrative medium. They have all the audio and visual capabilities of film, and combined with the unlimited possibilities of animation, and all that in an interactive environment, which is unique to games and makes things especially interesting. Now, over the last couple decades, game makers have been exploring that potential and producing some pretty great results. But that said, there's a lot of progress left to make, and unfortunately there are a few obstacles in the way of that progress. But we'll get to that later. Now if you'll indulge me, let me take you on a nerdy little history lesson. Back to the early days of video games, when the idea of games telling stories was laughable. You see, back in the day, games could barely establish basic context for themselves, much less tell a story. The graphics were so simple you could barely tell what they represented half the time without looking at the game packaging for a clue. You had two ambiguous blocks passing a smaller, ambiguous block back and forth, and that was about all there was to it. The designers had to put pictures of athletes holding paddles and the word pong really big across the front to help you realize what it was you were actually playing. Of course, things improved over time, and it didn't take long until better hardware allowed games to establish basic context on their own. You even started seeing simple stories, and even a few recognizable characters here and there. And sure, fat little plumbers fighting sentient mushrooms to save princesses from giant reptiles makes for a bizarre scenario, but it was a relatively complex bizarre scenario compared to what the preceding generation of games had offered. Anyway, game hardware kept growing stronger, and each new iteration increased games' capacity for storytelling. Basically, games would deliver better graphics, sound, and gameplay experiences all around, and game designers would find ways to use all these new capabilities. Designers kept experimenting, and they came up with all kinds of interesting ways to tell stories interactively. Some of them decided to harness the multimedia capabilities of games to craft linear cinematic epics a la Final Fantasy, essentially directing little interactive films. Other designers decided to just build a big open world and set players loose to explore, and let them discover the story at their own pace, such as the Elder Scrolls series and the controversial but still delightfully entertaining Grand Theft Auto games. But I'm starting to ramble, so let's just move on. Anyway, the point I'm clumsily grasping at is that games have evolved drastically over the years in almost every way. Graphics are happily nosediving into the uncanny valley, next-gen game consoles are showering us in 5.1 surround sound glory, and designers are polishing gameplay to a mirror shine. But the development of games as a narrative medium has been hitting a couple of snags along the way. Simply put, the majority of games are poorly written. Now, there are exceptions, and some offenders are worse than others, but even games lauded for being literary usually have subpar writing when compared to any other medium out there. Now, if you don't believe me, I got a little test for you. Go look at the DVD rack in your local Best Buy and try to find ten movies with a solid, well-written, thought-provoking story. I know you're kind of stuck in your chairs listening to me right now, so just use your imagination. But it'd be easy to find the ten films, right? Now, shuffle over to the video game rack, squeeze past the portly gentleman playing Guitar Hero, and try the same exercise as before. Find ten games with a solid, well-written, thought-provoking story. As you may have noticed, this is not so easy. So why don't games have the quality of writing that other media seem to have full access to? The first and most obvious problem is that developers are still just trying to figure out how to make well-written games. Believe me, it's not that they aren't trying at all. Trust me, these guys would love nothing better than to deliver the Citizen Kane of games. But you gotta cut them a little slack. They spent years struggling just to tell a story at all with the limited tools they had available to them at the time. And now that they have all the tools they need, they've just now realized that writing well is really, really, really hard. The people making video games may be brilliant designers and artists, but that does not make them capable writers. Now, the commonly accepted writing axiom is that you should write what you know. But many game designers are video game nerds themselves, and this collection of people has a tendency to be inspired by very specific genres of media. The designer of the critically acclaimed hit Bio, Shock once expressed this very concern, saying that most video game people have read one book and seen one movie in their entire life, which is Lord of the Rings and Aliens or some variations of that. And there's great things in that, but you need some variety. So when you feed into a closed system of geek culture, you're bound to get more than your fair share of cliches and regurgitated Star Wars dialogue. So over time, the lack of professional writing talent in the games industry became increasingly obvious. But the struggling developers were in luck. Professional writers soon gathered round, intent on applying their talent to this strange little medium. Unfortunately, those writers started hitting some snags of their own when they realized that writing for an interactive medium is very different from writing for passive media, like novels or film. Writing a linear story for an audience to watch or read is one thing, but managing to write a story for your audience to participate in is another thing entirely. Especially if your audience is stubborn and wants to experience the story on their own terms rather than yours. But it's okay. Designers are finally turning to writers for help, and writers are slowly discovering techniques for applying their craft to this new medium. So things are starting to work out. Unfortunately, those difficulties aren't the only issue holding game narrative back. Despite the best efforts of writers and developers alike, the shelves of our game retailers continue to runneth over with mediocre and poorly written games. How can this be, you might ask? The reason is frustratingly simple. Good writing doesn't sell games. 
Writing does not translate into money. A quick look at sales charts routinely shows games with barely passable writing in the top 10. While games with excellent writing, they may become critical favorites, but they never even make it on the charts. In fact, from a purely financial perspective, good writing is almost detrimental to a game's success. Now, this trend is probably not going to stop developers from innovating. After all, most game designers are passionate about their medium and are willing to take some risks to advance it. But a game needs two investing bodies to exist. The developer who creates the game and the publisher who puts it on the market for sale. It's just like authors and publishers in the literary world. Unless a developer can successfully pitch their game idea to a publisher, that game's not getting made. So what's supposed to convince publishers to finance story-driven game when shallow action title will be more profitable? Games are getting frighteningly expensive to develop, which makes ambitious, innovative game ideas all the more risky, and publishers don't tend to like that. Now, I can understand why publishers prefer safe investments that can promise reliable returns, but this trend toward safety is starting to kill the ambition and innovation that this industry has been known for. Warren Spector, designer of the acclaimed Deus Ex game, once lamented, you don't want to know how many projects I've been told to just go make a shooter. I had one publisher tell me you're not allowed to say story anymore. Now, for an example of this trend in action, allow me to tell you the story of Psychonauts, a game designed by Tim Schafer. Now, Schafer started off at LucasArts making funny adventure games, and then when LucasArts decided they didn't want to make funny adventure games anymore in favor of other projects, Schafer split off and started his own little studio called Double Fine. Now, for those of you who have never heard of Psychonauts, and I'm assuming that's all of you, Psychonauts tells the story of Raz, a young boy with psychic abilities who runs away from a life in the circus to attend a psychic summer camp, where he meets up with a delightful array of unstable yet charming campers and counselors. The player controls Raz as he explores the camp, gains new psychic abilities, and discovers a nasty plot to foil. To uncover the details of this plot and to save his fellow campers, he must enter other people's minds, fighting their demons, living their nightmares, literally sorting their emotional baggage, and uncovering their suppressed memories on the astral plane. The really cool part is that each mind you enter is a different level, featuring a unique design suiting the character. Like, for instance, the paranoid conspiracy theorist's mind features a world wrapped all around him with hidden cameras and G-men at every turn. The stiff control freak's mind is a tight, orderly cube which threatens to burst into disorder if he does not properly repress and maintain his emotions. It's a genuinely funny game, and it features clever dialogue and exceptional aesthetic design. It's really a shining example of what games can be. Now, originally Microsoft intended to publish Psychonauts as a high-profile release for its Xbox console, but they eventually dropped the game entirely. After months of searching, Schaefer finally found Majesco, a new publisher who picked Psychonauts up and released it shortly after. Unfortunately, despite all the praise it received from critics, the game was a complete flop. The losses hit Majesco hard, angering their shareholders and leading their stock to plummet. You can see why publishers are hesitant to involve themselves with games like these. Publishers know what sells, and right now they know good writing has nothing to do with it. And looking at what happened to Majesco, you can't blame them. So if designers want to create a well-written, innovative game, they better make a great sales pitch. Now all of this kind of makes the future of games look rather grim, but fear not. These obstacles can be overcome. First off, let's look at what developers can do. If a game developer wants to make a story-driven game, they need to bring a writer on board early. One of the more common missteps developers have been making is to pull writers in at the last minute, after the game's story's already been written, and expecting the writer to punch up the dialogue until the cliché, disjointed Lord of the Rings not off looks like a cohesive epic. As you can imagine, this doesn't work. But if writers are brought on staff from day one, they can help work out the foundation of a good story right from the start and solve narrative problems before they happen. This way, they can spend that saved time focusing on details like characterization and dialogue rather than solving the huge narrative mess you left for them. Then, once developers have got their writers on staff, they need to rework their development pipeline to give the writer some room to work. This means A, no more non-writers writing the story, and B, allotting time to test the story and refine it once it's in the game. The more room the writer has to work, the better. Of course, none of this hard work on the developer's part will make any difference if publishers refuse to touch their project. And for that to change, well-written games will have to start selling, and... Well, well, that's where we hit a snag of our own, because we can't reasonably expect publishers to throw their money at a risky venture just because we ask them to, so the only way to bring them on board is if well-written games start selling well. Now, this has actually happened. For instance, the acclaimed sci-fi shooter Half-Life 2, or the ultra-violent Greek mythology adventure God of War, or the 1950s undersea Anne Rand-inspired shooter Bioshock. All of these featured excellent writing, and all of them sold well. These successes are a good sign for the future, but publishers are going to have to see a lot more of this before they start taking more chances. Really, I'm afraid the only way these games are going to start selling reliably is for more consumers to show their support through their wallets, which is unfortunate because that has not been a reliable trend so far. You see, we gamers are starved for writing in games, so every time we're thrown a bone with a few scraps on it, we treat it like steak. If we want our hobby to develop as a medium for storytelling, we're going to have to stop praising games that are simply a step in the right direction and start looking for real quality and emotional impact. Now, if consumers do decide they want their games to improve and spend their money accordingly, Publishers will see good writing pay off, and developers will be allowed to explore new creative opportunities that were impossible before. One can hope, anyway. So my voice is tired, and I'm sure most of you are doodling in your sketchbooks or wishing you'd brought your sketchbooks by now, so let's wrap this whole thing up with a review. Games have come a long way and have the potential to go much further. Snags have been encountered, but as we've seen, they can be overcome. Developers and writers need to keep working to marry their crafts and crank out quality products, and consumers need to support these products if they want to see more. Video games are strictly a commercial art, at least they are for now, and that means that the future of games ultimately lies in the hands of the consumer, for better or for worse. So I guess all we can really do is keep our fingers crossed and enjoy the ride.